Ready? Yeah. All right. I'd like to call this meeting to order a regular meeting of the village board on Monday, October 18th at or about 7 p.m. in the Germantown Village Hall boardroom and also can be accessed via WebEx. This meeting has been given public notice in accordance with sections 19.83 and 19.84 of the Wisconsin statutes in such form that will apprise the general public and news media of subject matter that is intended for consideration and action. Roll call shows all village board members present except for Trustee Myers, who is not in his seat. We'll wait one second for him to get to his seat and then we'll all stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you. Next item on the agenda is president's report. Just a couple small things to report tonight. Uh, a week from this coming Sunday is October 31st. And uh, for those that have younger children and wish to go trick or treating, trick or treating hours for Germantown will be from 530 to 730 for those that want to participate. It is not a village back event by any means, but it is advertised on the website and in our newsletter as the times that are acceptable for trick-or-treating within uh, the village boundaries. Those that don't wish to have people come to their door, I would, might suggest that you just keep your front porch light off or something along those lines so that uh, the kids can skip your house and get right to the next one and get as much candy as possible in the two hours that they have to gather that. So uh, don't don't confuse the kids, or, but uh, it will be trick-or-treat this year and, uh, you know, uh, please uh, uh, participate if you want. Uh, if you don't want, then of course, um, just make sure it's clear that your house is not handing out candy that year. Next item I have is uh, 4th of July planning. We need to start uh, getting a group together to plan the 4th of J July events. Any of those that are out uh, in our audience listening um, or read information on our website, please let it be known that you'd like to participate or be part of this planning. So that as we put a team together to look at uh, all the particulates of what the 4th of July celebration is about, you can be included and part of that planning process, which I'd appreciate very much. That's all I have for president's report. So we can go to announcements of forthcoming events of public interest committee and department reports. And we'll start with uh, committee reports and committee chair with trustee Kaminsky. A public works will meet in this room at 6 p.m on Wednesday, November 3rd. Thank you. Trustee Miller. General Government and Finance uh, met just before this meeting and we'll meet again on Monday, November 15th at 6 p.m. Thank you. Trustee Myers. Uh, Mr. President, uh, Public Safety will meet on November 1st in this room at 6 p.m. Thank you. Does anyone else have anything else for announcements of forthcoming events of public interest committee or department reports they'd like to bring forward? Then we can go on to the next item, which is citizen input and public appearance on items not subject to a public hearing. There are no public hearings on tonight's agenda, but if there is anyone in our audience or joining us via WebEx that would like to participate in citizen input or public appearance, you're welcome to do so at this time. But before you do, I do have two communications that I received uh, that I'd like to read for the record. Uh, the first one uh, says, good evening, as you get ready to finalize the budget for the upcoming year of 2022, please remember that some of the citizens, but not all the citizens who live in the village of Germantown will have a huge 83% rate and PFP fees rate increase that will affect them. Thanks to the president and some of the current trustees who have been on the board since 2010 and did nothing until this year. All of us will be spending more at the stores on gas and utilities for our homes. We thought the goal for the board for the 2022 budget was going to be zero. We heard comments how well the budget was put together by Mr. Kreckle for 2022 at 0.7%. That will be another increase on top of the water rates and PFP fees for the citizens, but not all the citizens. At your last meeting, Mr. Kreckle said that you could raise the rate in small amounts for water for the next five years before you begin the PS, before you go to the PSC again. 
Does that mean for the next five years, the village is planning an increase for each of those years? Please tell us now so that we can plan for future increases, which bring up the extension of the 35 foot for the tower being built. Who approved this and who signed the contract and who will have to pay for this? Once again, we are sure it will be the citizens who was just hit with the huge 83% water rate and PFP fees, not all the citizens of the village. As you need to clear up, also you need to clear up the following issues. What did the village spend the 1.4 million that was uh, on the account for the water utility. A comment was made in the last two years. Some of the money was spent, but no one said what the money was for, how much is left in the account, how much is the account for the painting of the water tower. PSC that said that it needs to be cash paid with cash, not borrowed money. Also, our comments that we wrote to the PSC, we asked about a letter that was sent to Mr. Rotacek on 43021 about the impact fee for well number 11 for 320,000 that was to be returned to the people who paid. When was this taken care of or is it still out there? What happened to the money for the water meters replacement paperwork? Did we lose that money? Yes, we are still waiting to hear back from the PSC as well. Please note, it was interesting to see that the PSC made public for the citizens to see and read when the village file for the huge 83% increase. The board wonder why we catch almost all the meetings. If you don't watch, you really don't know what is going on in the village. Our little Germantown news doesn't have all the information in it. We would like to see the village administrator Kreklow have in his contract that he's required to live in the village that he works for. Maybe he would understand why citizens are upset about the increases if he lived and paid the same as the citizens have to. Now it's time for us to redo our budget due to the increase that the village will be placing on citizens along with all the other increases. And that comes from William and Carol Schneider on Bay Bayberry Circle in Germantown. The second one that we received uh, states, um, dear Ms. Miller, I don't know if you were on the website next door, but there have been many concerned on that site about the village of Germantown water bills that were sent out within the last week or two. It seems many, if not most, were inaccurate and it's up to the individual resident to contact the water utility to have the bill adjusted. I called and the woman who answered the phone was very professional and polite, but this seems to be a very haphazard way to fix the problem. What about the residents who are not on next door and do not realize that this problem exists? If this is this just a way for the village to make more money? It's bad enough they were going to have to have an 83% increase in our water bills. I doubt there's anything you can do, but be aware there are many unhappy residents and that is signed by Donna Arkenberg. So those are the two things that I received or, or we received as far as uh, communications from the residents. Does anyone within our audience or anyone joining us via WebEx uh, care to participate or uh, bring anything forward to this body in regards to citizen and Porter public appearance. Oh, and we can go to the next item on the agenda, which is um, consent agenda. Motion to approve D. Second. Motion made and seconded to approve consent agenda items A through D. Is there any discussion on that motion to approve? Yes. Trustee Ball. I'd like to pull item D because I have a conflict with it. Okay. D. D is in David. Got it. Any other discussion on the motion to approve? And we'll do roll call vote for items A through C. Trustee Meyer. Aye. Trustee Baum. Aye. Aye. Trustee Jan Miller. Aye. Trustee Knightwriter. Aye. Trustee Peeper. Aye. President Walter. Aye. Thank you. Item D, resolution 32 2021 2022 contract with Bocktail Tree and Science Services in an amount not to exceed $15,000. Motion to approve. Motion made. Do I have a second? second. Motion made and seconded. Discussion. Is it your wish to abstain? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Any discussion? And we'll do roll call vote for item D, please. Aye. Trustee Hudson? Aye. Trustee Jan Miller? Aye. Trustee Myers? Aye. Trustee Nightrider? Aye. Trustee Peeper? Aye. Trustee Baum, abstain. President Walter? Aye. Motion. Thank you. That then takes us to unfinished business. Uh, one item listed American Rescue Plan Act presentation. Uh, give us information on that. I'll turn the meeting over to uh, village administrator. 
All right, thank you. And we do have a brief PowerPoint that's coming up. <laughs> uh, should be up on on the screen momentarily, um, but I'll I'll jump in and, and get started here. Uh, in the meantime, um, the uh, as you know, the uh, uh, American Rescue Plan uh, Act was adopted in uh, March of this year. Um, I did give a presentation to the village board. Um, in April with some of the initial preliminary information that we had available. Um, it was a, uh, or is a $1.9 trillion economic stimulus package. It included uh, some money for state and local governments, um, including uh, what worked out to be about $65 billion uh, for local governments. And for the village of Germantown, that worked out to about $2.1 million that we'll be receiving in two cash payments. Uh, the first was received in June of this year and is currently um, in, in village accounts. Uh, the second payment of, of $1.05 million is expected to be received in June of uh, 2022. So there are some uh, eligible uses and some ineligible uses that have been identified uh, by the uh, Department of Treasury, uh, some guidelines for local government to um, uh, to use these funds. So first, some of the eligible uses, uses um, we can use these to cover any, uh, any expenses that we've incurred uh, to respond to the public health emergency um, and uh, whether those were incurred in the past or are ongoing. Um, the uh, funds can be used uh, for payments for uh, uh, municipal employees who were deemed essential workers and, and performed um, uh, performed their duties during uh, the, the pandemic. Um, they can be applied towards revenue losses that the village incur occurred, um, incurred during uh, 2020 or, or in 2021 as a result of, uh, of COVID-19. They can also be used uh, for investments in sewer, water, or broadband infrastructure projects, um, and they can be used uh, for investments to offset negative economic impacts of, of COVID-19, so some fairly broad eligible uses. Um, there are some, some ineligible uses that um, uh, we should keep in mind. Uh, states and territories cannot use ARPA funding to directly or indirectly offset a reduction in net tax revenue. Um, the guidelines at this point do not include municipal governments in that category. Um, uh, and, uh, uh, it, it appears that that restriction does not necessarily apply to municipal governments. Um, the uh, funds cannot be deposited into pension funds or used to fund debt service, uh, and they cannot be used to fund any legal settlements or judgments. And then finally, um, we could not use those funds to put them into our our, as we just heard about in GGF, our uh, general fund balance uh, as our, our financial reserve or, or rainy day fund. So those are, are the ineligible uses that have been identified. Um, there are some uh, principles or some guidelines that the Government Finance Officers Association has distributed as recommendations. These are not requirements, but recommendations for uh, uh, municipal governments to follow in determining how to use the ARPA funding. Um, one is to avoid ongoing financial commitments. Um, in other words, treat these funds as, as one-time revenues and use them for only one-time expenses. Um, this could be applied also if we were looking at acquiring assets that required maintenance or programming, um, you know, that there should be some consideration given to um, how we would fund those, those uh, the ongoing operations of the assets that we might acquire using ARPA funds. Um, GFOA recommends that we prioritize critical infrastructure, that where there are needs to upgrade or, or replace old infrastructure uh, um, or add additional infrastructure, uh, that, that those types of, of expenditures would receive priority. 
Um, GFOA also recommends we prioritize fiscal resiliency, uh, which is a way of, of saying that we look at maintaining our flexibility and our ability to adapt to future emergencies um, in, our, in our use of the funds. And then finally, um, GFOA recommends as a best practice that we look at how other uh, neighboring uh, governments, whether they be other, other villages, um, uh, counties, states, or, or regional authorities are utilizing their funds and look for opportunities to work together um, and collaborate with, with other municipalities as, as being a best practice for the use of these funds. Uh, one of the things that we have done here recently is there is a specific formula that uh, Department of Treasury uh, looks at in order to determine revenue loss due to COVID-19. Based on that methodology, um, the village lost $1.5 million worth of, of revenues in 2020 as a result of, of COVID-19. So out of that $2.1 million that, that uh, we're receiving, from ARPA, um, 1.5 million of that could be used to replace those lost revenues. Um, and uh, there may be some additional lost revenues from 2021. We'll have to run through the calculation at the end of the year, but it is possible that that the, that, that number will go up somewhat. Uh, now that does provide some additional flexibility in terms of, of the, the, the use of those funds. And, what that flexibility is, is something that um, has not been fully defined yet. Um, for example, I don't know if we could use that, use money that is, uh, uh, that we're eligible for as part of a revenue loss for something that is otherwise deemed ineligible. Um, that I haven't seen a, a, a case study or, or a specific rule that, that states that. So that's one of the things that we'll have to, to wait and see to some extent. Um, the, um, the next slide, uh, just uh, the next and final slide on this presentation to talk a little bit about next steps. Um, uh, staff is planning to come back to the, the village board with this with ARPA funds on, on the agenda at one of the December meetings. Um, one of the things that I, I guess another best practice, not a GFOA best practice, but that other organizations have been recommending is we do look at some methods of soliciting public comment or input into how those funds are used. And I think we can, um, uh, you know, allow for some public comment at the uh, December meeting when we put ARPA on the agenda, agenda and let people know that this would be an opportunity to give suggestions or ideas. I think we could also look for uh, some opportunities for people to provide that type of feedback uh, using social media and the, the village website. So we'll look at some opportunities for doing that, um, as well as, as looking at getting some board um, ideas and and uh, direction to staff um, in terms of, of what things to explore a little bit further. Uh, and then uh, finally, sometime in the period of January through March, uh, I would look to the village board to um, review and, and adopt an ARPA plan and to use those funds. Um, we do have a, a quite a bit of time available in terms of, of, of um, of utilizing the funds under the federal requirements. They have to be, uh, and this is a, a legal terminology term from the federal government, they have to be obligated by the end of 2024. Um, so in other words, we have to have a, um, they, they don't have to be expended by the end of 2024, but they have to be um, under contract uh, to be expended uh, by the end of 2024. So. Not to say we should wait until the last minute, but there is a significant amount of time before the, the village has to make those decisions and, and move forward. That I'd be happy to answer any questions. I have a question. It, so they'll be coming in two payments? Correct. Correct. The, uh, the first payment we did receive in, Jan or, uh, in June of this year, and uh, the next payment is, should be coming approximately one year later. Okay. And you're going to bring these directly to the board, or it's not going to go through any committee for vetting? <laughs> well, I think that would be uh, that's something the, the board can determine in in December. Um, you know, as far as the, it, would, it would depend on the ideas for how it would be expended, um, what that plan looks like. There are quite a variety of options that are available to the board. I think when we talk in December, we'll we'll 
provide sort of a, a broad array of the possibilities that, that could be utilized. And I'm sure there will be a lot of things that staff hasn't thought about or that the residents and citizens will bring up as, as well as trustees. So one of the rec recommendations was to cover the 1.5 million in lost revenues for 2020. You know, being when we recognized, you know, what was happening with, uh, with COVID and we, we cut some of the programs and did some other we didn't do some other expenditures. We actually ended up being um, in a pretty good where we weren't really at a loss at the end of the year for 1.5 million. So how do you go back to 2020 and recoup that revenue? I mean, isn't it just applied in a way going forward? Yes, yes. Um, we did finish the year. We made other adjustments and, and finished the year uh, Actually, with, from our auditors here uh, earlier this evening, two hundred and sixty-seven thousand uh, dollar surplus for the year. Um, so, I, I think that what the village board could do, first of all, that we are eligible for one and a half million dollars in ARPA funds. We've proven our eligibility based on the fact that that the way they calculate revenue loss, um, we um, uh, we would qualify. I think it would open up some alternatives from the board. For example. One of the things we cut out that year, we we did uh, we skipped seal coating for that year. Um, one of the options for the board uh, would be to um, take three hundred thousand, which is about what we spent would have spent on seal coating, and double up in twenty twenty two. That would be the one way that the board could use it as an example. The questions, Trustee Hudson. I have a question about clause two and how we can spend the money. A lot of the village employees uh, actually put their lives on the line services to the taxpayers over the last year. Using clause two, are we allowed to give bonuses to village employees? Yes. Yeah, that is my understanding. Um, I. I believe that's also something that, as I have heard from other communities uh, going through the collective bargaining process, that some of the employees who are 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 were essential employees, police and fire. Um, there were there are other village employees who are deemed essential, um, but uh, uh, are including that in in the collective bargaining process. So that is something um, that is out there. But but the uh, ARPA does explicitly state that that some of the funds can be used to provide additional pay to um, uh, local government employees who were deemed essential workers. Thank you. Other questions? No other questions? Trustee Jan Miller. Uh, would you be able to send this to us? Sure. Yeah. Yep. That'd be helpful. Yeah. Okay, anything else for unfinished business item A? Right, then we can go to uh, next item, which is new business, and we start new business with item A: employee health care plan design. I will start while our, our benefits consultant comes to the um, uh, comes to the podium. There, there are two items on the agenda: uh, the approval of a contract, and also a, approval of employee health care plan design. Um, and I guess I just just wanted to provide a bit of background, as I think all of the trustees are are well aware. We've seen a lot of increases in our costs for employee health care um, over the past several years, um, and uh, we've been increasing funding within the village budget to um, uh, to help to cover those expenses. Um, one of the other things that the the village board has looked at, and I think. Uh, um, you know, responding to uh, uh, residents' um, concerns as well is that it has to be a, a shared relationship that the, the village taxpayers and, and utility rate payers are picking up a portion of the increased cost, but also with an expectation that um, the uh, uh, that employees will, will pay more as well. And um, I think the first thing not sure that it is looking at the PowerPoint. It's going to be the first thing up 
but the first thing that we need to talk about are the uh, the design changes, and um, the the most significant design changes are that uh, the employees will be paying more out of the out of pocket maximum. And, um, uh, the, I don't know if we can get that slide up. But. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I don't mean to step on your presentation either, but there were some things I kind of wanted to, to to get out there. Um, so, the um, uh, the uh, in red, um, you can see that the the increases from the current plan to the uh, uh, to the proposed plan are are pretty significant in terms of what employees um, are are going to be paying in the future. Um, you can see that. In the, the lower portion, the mitigation exposure under for both the, the gold plan and the silver plan, um, a total savings and it's not really a savings. It's a it's a it's costs that employees will be take, uh, taking on of, of about ninety five thousand dollars. And I, I guess I, I wanted to take the time to point that out. We've started talking with employees about this. Um, it is um, it, it is a significant um, uh, increase uh, for the employees and. Um, I think that the feedback I've gotten from from the employees is that they, they definitely um, appreciate the fact that that the village offers health care. The village offers a good health care plan, um, you know. But but definitely, uh, there is it, it is a it is a significant shift um, in expenses, and uh, um, you know for uh, for employees employees will be the way I see it kind of. Um, uh, Contributing, contributing their uh, uh, their fair share uh, to the increase, and and that's what's before the village board for adoption tonight. A question, hey, Trustee just Kaminsky. Remind us what the percentage um, paid is paid out by employees right now. The premium contribution isn't changing, and that's twelve percent. So. Um, uh, in addition to the items that are included here, the deductibles, the, uh, the out of pocket, the co-insurance, um, the employees also pay 12% uh, towards um, what the, the premium, premium equivalent rate is. Um, and that on a, as a dollar amount that's going to go up for employees uh, because as costs go up, the premium equivalent goes up, uh, but the percentage we're proposing stays the same and, and a big reason for that is that's something that has to be negotiated so if we make that change it applies only to the non-represented employees and it doesn't have as big an impact as these changes these changes apply to all that don't have to be negotiated and they can apply to all gotcha. all village employees Do you define moop for me please maximum out of pocket Let her do her presentation. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I was. Uh, I was. I, I apologize. I. I was. I. Uh, no. I. I uh, it's completely fine. So um, obviously, change is. You know, is healthcare is not something that is easy. So I'm going to kind of just. Step back in the moment. process last year. Claimants did go to market like we did last year. Last year we did not get any take. Company, it is not fully insured. It is self-funded, so you still stay on the same kind of platform that you are, but you're going to be moving to United Healthcare Company. So that, for the employees, will help mitigate calling multiple different places for their health. Just one of the things we kind of heard. If you look at the so Axiant renewal, 15% maximum cost, and they had 
three lasers that were going to be happening on their particular bid that they had, which was 150, there was um, 250s and then there was 175. UMR is coming in at an overall almost 2%. We still do have two participants that have lasers on them. We're very concerned about them. But overall, in the uh, renewal process, we were able to get UMR to come in at reducing your fixed cost by 9 10%. Fixed costs are your numbers that you have to pay out to the carrier. Your claims funding portion of it is what can go up and down, okay? That goes up regarding claims that are being paid out or incurred by employees. It can go down if employees are not using your plan. So those can fluctuate a lot, but what you pay out is going to be your fixed cost. And that fixed cost savings, we're looking at about $73,000 in savings by going to UMR. So that is hard dollars that you would need to save one way or another. Again, the fixed cost sorry, uh, factors, the attachment point and the retirement, they do go up and down as the claims fluctuate. But years that we had shown you, I think it was in March, we shown you the and your trend line of fully insured contract is actually still less being self-funded than paying out full-fledged dollars to a fully insured contract. Fully insured contract can get as low as 2% of your income. So that can be self-funded depending upon the employee's budget plan changes and can help mitigate those costs. <coughs> move to UMR. The so what we're trying to do is just mitigate obviously your exposure. So the renewal at the minus two would definitely be something that we can be moving forward with with those uh, your employees. Questions on the renewal? Laser means, I heard you. <laughs> what is a laser, please? A laser means that that particular participant would have a higher spec deductible than any other participant in there. What happens is that the village would be on the hook for a higher amount of money and claims for that particular participant than having your $50,000 deductible currently. Other questions? Trustee Myers. Is there a particular amount that is paid um, for somebody to handle each particular claim? And does that change by what they are, what type of claim they actually are? The administration costs do change. On here, the administration cost for um, Axiant is $20.75 to administer your claims. For um, UMR, it would be roughly around, I think it's $11. Does it make a difference in what type of claim we, we, we might have? When we have a claim, it means a hospital brings in a particular claim. Is that what you mean by that? Claim gets adjudicated the same, whether it's Oxiant or whether it would be United Healthcare fully insured, or if it would be UMR self funded. How they pay the claim according to your plan document, no matter what happens. So it doesn't get paid differently. So I'm, maybe I'm not understanding your question. Right. What, what I mean by that, and I'm not sure in regard to this why I'm asking this, but um, if a person has, um, goes to a doctor for a particular um, procedure as such, versus a person who's, who's on cancer is going to have a lot of claims. So, so what I'm trying to ask is, each time a, a, a bill comes in, is that a claim? Yes, yep. Anytime anybody goes to the doctor, anybody goes to have a chiropractic done, anybody has 
um, a prescription drug, they call that a claim. Um, chemotherapy, any, any kind of service through a provider or a hospital or a prescription company, that is a claim. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Okay. okay. So Steve stole my thunder. <laughs> And the other one, which is great. He explained it wonderfully. Do you have any questions regarding the plan design change? There is one um, item on there that is green. I just wanted to point this out. Because before your plan was three times a family deductible on your goal plan, we're moving that down to be more consistent with like a fully insured contract, which is two times. So we're just trying to make it a little bit more consistent on how we do that deductible for our employees. Any questions on that? What's, what's the difference between, you have your deductible of 2,500 to 5,000 in network and then you have your um, money out of pocket at 6,350 to 12,7. Usually the deductible is what you can pay down based off of whatever percentage, it, you know, out, it's still out of pocket and then they'll start kicking in their, their 2080 or whatever that is. Yeah, and so what's the MOOP then? What is what is that? Maximum out of pocket. So, so per, is that per, if you're on a family plan, is that per family member? The 6350 would be per family member mm -hmm. for two times per to be maximum. So let's just take the silver plan, okay? Mm -hmm. The silver plan's got a $2,500 deductible for a single, 5000 for a family in network. Once you hit your deductible, it will go to the next level of insurance is 90% in network. So any bill that would be, let's just say $10,000, pay the first 2,500. After that, you're gonna be paying 10%. That 10% and deductible will go towards your maximum out of pocket. Okay. okay? Mm -hmm. So then it's two times a family. Questions on the plan design? Trustee Myers. How did you come up with these amounts that I'm looking at from silver and gold plan in the red? In the red? Yes. Those are the maximums that you, UMR says we have to do for maximum out of network. Okay. So before your deductible was the same in network and out of network, UMR says you need to have steerage for in network and out of network because you want employees to go to the most discounted provider, not running to somebody that doesn't have a discount because that will help your plan. So it's called steerage to help them stay in network. I understand that part, but unless I'm doing this wrong here, um, looking on the left hand side, out of in the gold plan, 1,752. Now it's changed to five to 10, almost double. Or am I reading it wrong? The maximum amount of pocket on the yeah. silver? Yep. yep. So we, we're getting them more in line of an actual fully insured contract. Those, the maximum amount of pocket for a fully insured contract, depending on what, if you're small group or large group, Small group is actually right now eighty one fifty, so eight thousand one hundred and fifty dollars for a small group. That means anything that's under fifty. That's what their maximum the government says they can charge an employee. And then once that happens, they have to be totally paid at one hundred percent. So we're just trying to get more in line with that to have the employees incur those expenses. Now, the only way somebody truly is going to incur an expense, correct? is if they're going to be having a surgery or they're gonna have some kind of a claim. I'm not talking a claim of sniffles, right? Because on this, the gold plan, you have a copay. And on this, the, um, the HSA plan, the silver plan, you already know that you're gonna be paying that actual claim of what the dollar amount is for that office visit. So we're just trying to make sure that the village is getting kind of maximum share with the employees. Does that include drugs? How's that? The maximum amount of pocket does correct. It, it pays on there, yes. Now they have the different plans in regard to the different prescriptions, et cetera, correct? Um, 
see there's three different uh, groups that they're in. Are you talking the co-pays and where they're landing in no, like generic and stuff? I'm talking about in regard to, not doing a good, good job again, but they have different kinds of drugs that are in different groups. Correct, different tiers, correct. Tiers, tiers, okay, yep. thank different you. Different tiers, so each tier, you would have your tier one is typically a generic medication. Right. Tier two is gonna be your generic with any, uh, a brand with a generic equivalent. Tier three is gonna be your brand with no generic equivalent. Those amounts would be included in there. Those co-pays, and that would be no different than a fully insured contract. You go to a fully insured carrier, the maximum out of pocket encompasses all of your expenses. Herman, the other question would be, uh, in tier one, what would be the uh, uh, the co-pay that they would pay? Uh, it would, we weren't changing the co-pays. We're not changing the co-pays, we're just changing the maximum that they would expend on their actual total health care. I know you're not changing, but what is it? Oh, I don't, I don't have that right in front of me. I don't have the that right in front of me. I mean, I. No, oh, th that's fine. I think it's ten dollars if I. But I don't, I don't have the actual plan design in front of me. We were just talking about the different changes. Thank you. <laughs> the questions. Trustee Hudson. Is Aurora Healthcare in network? They're in network now. I work for them, so I shouldn't vote on oh, the issue. Okay, that's fine. I'm just saying they're 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 in network in the current plan design that you have to. Other questions? Trustee Baum. Um twelve percent that we're looking to have staff pay of their deductible. Twelve percent of premium. Is there a percentage that is standard standard in our industry? Is this low, is this high? What can you tell me about that 12% number? Municipalities are at 12%. Across the board? And I, I have something that, there is very rare they go up higher, but we actually have something on the next slide. Yeah, don't because do a Steve. <laughs> I'll wait for now. <laughs> so, next slide, please. All right. So, we talked about Go 365. I don't know if all of you understand what Go 365 is. It is a product that you, Humanic brought out that helps get employees engaged in their health care. We did talk about this in a meeting. I, don't, I think it was at GGF, but we talked about Go 365 to get employees healthy and get them going. So, what we're proposing is to put Go365 in here to have them meet a silver status in 2022. If they do not meet that silver status in 2022, their contribution would go up to 25%. It actually works the opposite direction. Is how you would do it if you say you need to get to silver to drop the actual contribution down from 25 to the 12%. I don't know if that really answers your question, but the majority of municipalities, they do have it at 12%. There are some right now that are doing the same exact thing like this to help mitigate those costs. Private sector have a different number? Private sector is anywhere from 75 to 80%, depending on manufacturing. Manufacturing can actually be up to about 60% right now. Two HR plans that we have, one pays 50% of premium, the manufacturing actually pays 80%, um, and the employee pays 20%. But with this silver and gold, I'm actually familiar with gold. Uh, so once the employee actually reaches silver, they get a discount on their each month, don't they? It, yes, it, well, they would, it, it would be dropped. So what happens is go 365, you get till two, uh, what did we, October, I think, of next year to do your silver status. That then qualifies you in 2023 to get back down to the 12%. So what we were doing with this was passing the savings onto the employees to give incentive to 
uh, have it actually taken off uh, or lowered. So if that is, that's well, no, but if, if you're saying, okay, we're going to pay 12% of the premium, but you're requiring them and to get silver status in order to keep at 12%. Correct. But if they're still paying 12%, we're still paying 88. I'm saying the overall premium price drops a percentage. That's only with Humana. If yeah. you are fully with, insured with, with Humana. 365. Fully insured with Humana. Okay. We're buying this as a standalone product. Oh, okay. This gotcha. is a total standalone product that we are using the whatever. platform. Yeah, using the platform to get where we need to be. So, okay. But yes, Humana does give you that money back. And yes, employers should say it is 99% give the money back yeah. to the employees, but not all of them do. I do love the goal, the goal 365 program, and I do think it, I mean, it's so easy to get this, this stuff, get your well visit. So you, you have to meet certain health requirements in order to get a silver status? Nope. So you have to go through a program. So the ones that are going to get you the silver is going to do, it's called a health risk assessment. So you answer questions online that is on your lifestyle changes. Mm -hmm. You can answer them truthfully, which I hope employees do, but it's a matter of answering them. Right out there are saying if you eat vegetables, if you walk, if you, um, if you have beverages at a certain time, obviously every day or things like that. Um, those kinds of things are what they need to answer. And then the other one that is a big ticket item for them is to go and get, it's called biometrics. So there's freestanding clinics or they need to go to their doctor to get a uh, blood draw, to get what their triglycerides, all that kind of stuff is. And then there's a form, they upload it, it goes right to Go365, they get points, and those are the two major things that you're gonna get. And it's gonna help you get to Silver Lake. Yeah. Jan? Are you going to uh, provide the biometrics at the village hall, the DPW? No. No, at this, oh. we weren't. We had issues in the past where nobody would come to the biometrics, or a few people would come. So this year we decided that they need to do it on their own. I can just add it is a bit of a challenge of, of, the, of the employees that are covered, a lot of them are not working in Village Hall, um, work different shifts. The fire department has one set of shifts, police department has another set of shifts, uh, DPW has another group of working hours. And, and you know, and I, just to, to add on, and I, not to steal Carmen's thunder, but to, to add on, uh, you know, in our past, we, we did that on site uh, the past four years, or I think we, we did miss 2020, we didn't do it on site. But the other, other three years I've been here, we did it on site. We've only had about about 26 people who have been participating in it out of about 100 that are eligible. So that's, we thought we needed to revisit this, that this is one of the long-term things that we need to try to do to, to keep our healthcare costs uh, as, as manage, managed as best that we can. Um, so it provides kind of that carrot and the stick approach. There's some rewards if you participate. There's some additional costs if you don't. Um, and, uh, uh, and, and the thought was, and this is something we can look at if, if we get feedback from the staff, we could have something here, but, but generally the feedback we've gotten is people would just as soon prefer to go to their, their own physician and uh, you know, get the, the tests done there. Here. And I mean, it is going to be to the employees to go to their doctor. It's a covered item. Trustee Chan Miller? Uh, do you send out notices? You know, they have to start doing this, and there's cutoff dates. Are you administering? Like, um, you better get your biometrics done if you want the health care. Yep, we're just, having a kickoff meeting to explain to the employees and then this committee that um, we're and then we do have a wellness coordinator on off staff that helps out with that as well. So is there a program like MyChart or something that helps to direct some of that? 
uh, I'm not sure the my chart would help with that because there's a form they have to complete. So the doctor, yeah. So the form they would have to complete. So I don't know if anybody's done it, but there's a form and then you upload it and you can take a picture right on your phone. So what helps out with this too is have an eye exam, they can take a picture of the explanation of benefits, upload it, get points for that, things like that. So the the form itself you can upload and send it through my chart to your doctor. Sure. I just I did it myself this year, R and R. In the beginning, R and R wasn't gonna do an event of biometrics, so I decided that I wanted to get my points right away. I went to my doctor with the actual sheet, the physical sheet. He completed it literally five minutes when I was there. And then I just took it with me and took a picture and sent it right to my phone. Any questions on how that's gonna work? Or again, we have a November 11th is get a kickoff meeting to the employees. Humana will be here to tell them what's going on, help them through that. At that point, if they, uh, January, we can come back again, have them bring their phones or whatever, we can get them all signed up for that. There are actually two action items. Um, under B, uh, the uh, plan design, we're asking for approval of the changes to the um, plan design, the, the maximum out-of-pocket uh, amounts. Um, and then the second item, which hasn't been read in, but was really the first item that, that we talked about here, the presentation, the um, uh, contract with United Medical Resources, UMR. So we're asking for approval for both of those items this evening. Make sure, are we done with the presentation? Let's make sure out of respect for the presenter. Okay. I'm trying to figure out if I had a list anymore. <laughs> Good. All right. Then we can go to um, item B, which is healthcare plan administration contract with United Medical Resources, United Healthcare Third Party Administrator Solution. Presentation or a motion? Trustee Baum. Uh, I'll make a motion to approve the uh, United Medical Resources under the United Healthcare Third Party Administration as presented. Second. Motion made and seconded. Discussion. Part of 12%, 75% talk about it this time. That's, the, that's that? the other one. That's second. That's item A. Second one. Just for the plan. Who's going to administer the plan? Before I'm approving item A. All right, then go to item A and make a motion. Well, I'm going to stick with this one first. Get this one done. Okay. Let's get the insurance company on board. All right, any discussion on that motion to approve? Roll call vote, please. Trustee Baum? Aye. Trustee Myers? Aye. Trustee Hudson? Trustee Kaminsky? Aye. Trustee Jan Miller? Aye. Trustee Rick Miller? Aye. Trustee Knight Rider? Aye. Trustee Peeper? Aye. President Walter? Okay. So the motion for going, going back to item A now? Mm -hmm. The motion for item A would be to approve the, go back to the slide that shows the numbers on it. Approve the adjusted gold and silver plans <laughs> is this what am i approving or am i approving the other one this is this one this is okay i want to approve the gold and silver plan design as presented and include the uh what's the program that you talk about Go 365 plan. Motion made. Do I have a second? Motion made and seconded. Discussion. 
Discussion? Yeah, I got, I got. Trustee Paul. We have talked about these Go 65s before, but we have never done it before. Is that, that's correct? Because they just, they just seem so familiar to me. And I think it's because I just keep hearing it year in and year. Is that the case? I don't recall that we've ever talked about Go 365. We, we have had a wellness program that's much, that's been much more limited. Um, so we have had other wellness programs. We have had other that's... wellness programs. And, and I think, you know, when I've talked with people, this is one that a lot of employers are using. Yeah. Um, and I think a, a lot of people have heard of it from spouses or neighbors or things who are participating in it. Further discussion? No further discussion? Roll call vote. Trustee Baum? Trustee Peeper? Aye. Trustee Hudson? Aye. Trustee Kaminsky? Trustee Rick Miller? Aye. Trustee Jan Miller? Aye. Trustee Myers? No. Trustee Nightrider? Aye. President Walter? Aye. Okay. Thank you. Next item under new business is item C, effective date for the water rate increase. Administrator. I have, uh, no, there's no presentation on this item, and uh, but there is an update, and I am looking from, for some direction from the village board. Um, as uh, I informed you all a, a couple of weeks ago uh, via email, we did receive notification from the Public Service Commission that they have approved our rate application um, and uh, the, uh, the increased uh, uh, water rates. The question then becomes the timing for implementation. Uh, we are allowed a window of 90 days after approval to uh, modify those changes, which gets us through the, uh, the end of the year. Um, initially, when we had had these conversations, uh, we had discussed implementing the uh, the new rates for the fourth quarter of the year. However, uh, given the challenges that we've had with our billing system, um, and uh, you know it's uh, it's uh, age and and it, the fact that it's showing its age, um, I think that staff has some concerns about trying to implement the uh, uh, the new rates mid quarter. Um, although that is something the PSC would allow. Um, as a result, though, staff is recommending that uh, that we implement the new fees uh, at the beginning of 2022, um, and uh, we can begin the process. If that is uh, that is approved by the village board, we can begin the process of notifying uh, the water utility customers of when the rate will take it will increase will take place, and and getting that uh, all of those required notifications out. Um, people would see the effect of the, the new rates on the bills that they receive after the first quarter of 2022, which would, um, uh, which they'd be receiving in early April. Trustee Kaminsky. Um, how would that affect the finances of the uh, water utility? In the, uh, in the long run, um, the, the effect is really minimal. Um, these rates will be in effect for a long time and uh, missing one quarter's worth of, right. uh, of okay. impacts will not be significant. The other thing is, as we heard in, in GGF um, earlier today, as our auditors went through the water utility finances, um, they, they, are, they did experience a, a loss, uh, that operating loss uh, again last year, but their, their cash is, is manageable when they look at their current assets versus current mm -hmm. liabilities. I was going to say, if we can afford to do that, I think it's the right thing to do to not let this hit this year before Christmas and the holidays and gives everybody a chance to communicate what's happening and gives you a chance to get your new system on board and make sure the software and everything's working correctly because we don't want errors on top of an increase. It's just going to make it a much, much more difficult problem. I would say wait until January. That is a motion. Motion made and seconded. Discussion. I would agree with Trustee Kaminsky in regards to the, the starting date um, for those reasons and um, most importantly as we're getting up our new financial system. 
it, it makes it easier to integrate from the starting ground rather than trying to catch something halfway in between on an existing system that really can't be updated too well. So I, I agree with it for that reason. Further discussion? Trustee Myers. I agree also, but I'm curious in uh, regard to the meters, which is what Paula had mentioned, that there's a lot of problems with those. Are we able to start replacing them any sooner? We um, actually, I, uh, I met with uh, Paul Haugen, the water superintendent, this morning as he was um, getting in place the contract for installation. So, and I have gotten a couple of questions from residents on this topic as well. Um, the village board approved and, and we executed a, a contract to purchase the replacement meters earlier this year. Um, we went through a uh, proposal process for the installation of the meters um, and uh, selected a vendor uh, that was also approved by the village board. And uh, now we're in the contract. I guess I don't believe, no, I'm, I apologize, I misspoke. It, it, it was coming to the village board for approval for installation. Um, I believe we'll be able to get that project started this winter, um, and there, the, the cash the cash flow will work, um, you know, based on the the numbers that we saw here from Baker Tilly earlier today. Yeah, I, I think Paul had mentioned that it, it would take three months to actually install them. There's a lot of variables, and that's what we were talking about, um, you know. Uh, but gen but he believes that that we should be able to have the process complete within about three months. So we ordered all the meters that we needed and have the, that quantity in mind. Are we going to be able to get what we ordered or is there going to be a lag? I believe since our order was in as early as it was that uh, um, we haven't heard anything about supply chain issues at, at this point. So um, I think that we may have been um, sometimes my, my college basketball coach used to say every time I made a shot, it's better to be lucky than good. Um, and uh, we may have been a, a little bit lucky to get that uh, uh, that order in early. Okay. Thank you, Steve. Trustee Hudson. Rotation of the increase is a time thing, so we can't spread it out. Uh, that's that's correct. Um, although I will mention that the. You know, the number that's quoted oftentimes of the 83% does include the phase one and the phase two uh, step increase. So, um, so, so what is the actual increase that our residents would see starting January 1st? It's the, the larger increases, the phase one. Um, I don't have that number in front of me. I believe that was 72 or 74%. It was in the 60s with the second one. I can I can look those numbers up and and send uh, an email out to the trustees with the with the correct numbers just to make sure I don't speak. Further discussion, Trustee Jan Miller. I agree with um, holding off on the uh, rate increase until that Q1, so the residents wouldn't get the bill increase until April. And um, I did have uh, some residents reach out. And concerned about the 83% that that's been going around. So, um, whatever you can provide for us, that would be great. Well, and I appreciate that. And we will, as we communicate this, um, try to um, uh, get as much information as we can out, out to residents um, and about the the impacts. Uh, the, the eighty three percent number is a number it's not it's not incorrect um there it's not a wrong number um it is uh but it's not the the entire uh story um the uh, uh the dollar amount itself um and and i think one of the things that confuses people the most is they look at their entire utility bill and, and the increase only applies to the water line so um you know generally for most people they're their sewer bill is is a higher dollar amount on their on their utility bill than the water amount, and and oftentimes when people call in with questions, they're looking at their entire utility bill and thinking that's going up by eighty three percent, and and only the water line is going up. So, the PSC when they looked at at some numbers, um, you know, on average the average household 
uh, uses about 12,000 gallons of, of, of water per quarter. And um, for, those, for those average households, they're looking at a quarterly increase to their bill of, you know, in the 20 to $25 range. Um, so it, it is, and I, I don't ever want to minimize what people pay, but uh, uh, on their bills, um, you know, every dollar is important. But um, but it is, you know, looking at about eight dollars per month um, uh, for for the average household. Um, so it, it it's not as as onerous as I think as sometimes it, it appears when when people look at that eighty three dollar number. The other thing that I think is an important piece of information is um, if you look at where our our utility bill uh, our, our utility bills where our water bills were relative to other similar sized utilities in Ozaki, Washington, and Waukesha County, um, before the rate increase takes effect, we were we were the lowest of of anybody um, in you know uh, anybody our size um, in those three counties. Uh, the first step of the, the rate increase gets us slightly above average, um, and the second step when it takes place would, would put us at about the 25th percentile. Um, and that's assuming that no other municipalities have rate increases, and I know that a number of them are also going through a similar uh, rate increase process. So it doesn't put us, out, it doesn't put us outside of the norm of, of what people in neighboring communities are, are paying for their water. Which is just over the median. Um, in comparison, oh. what the 83 percent also includes, though, is the PFP charges, uh, as well of, of what this board decided to put on as part of the uh, uh, hydrant fees. I'd like to say I didn't vote for it. So noted. Further discussion. Any further discussion? We'll call vote, please. Aye. D. Hudson? Aye. D. Jan Miller? Aye. D. Myers? Aye. Mike Ryder? Aye. Trustee Cooper? No. Aye. Yep. Next item under new business is Washington County Library Service Board Agreement. I guess more information on that. We have our director of the library, Trish. It's all yours. Um, that county that you have uh, in your packet is the countywide library service agreement for Washington County. This primarily deals with service to our non library Washington County residents. That is 15 out of the 20 municipalities in Washington County. This contract was last updated in 2014, so it's uh, definitely due for, for an update. All of the um, updates did come from recommendation by the five Washington County directors when we did our joint library study uh, last year when we finalized that there were a lot of uh, things that we um, came into light with how the county is funded and updating information on the contract. So all of the changes did come directly from the five Washington County directors. The contract was approved by the Washington County Library Services Board last month, and also the Village of Germantown Library Board at our um, meeting at the end of September. Um, just a couple highlights on the, the changes that we made. Um, the levy is flat. Um, it has been flat for uh, over five years at the county. So this is, um, the changes are directly involved in how the funding is allocated, not necessarily an increase in funding. One of the uh, changes is how we are getting paid and what our payment structure is. Right now we are paid on a quarterly basis. So our numbers from the first quarter, January, February, and March come in and we get paid in the second quarter. So we're always going quarter to quarter. That makes it very challenging to do our budgets. Um, we don't know what we're getting for the next year. Um, we always uh, guess based on previous usage um, 
but it's never a guarantee. We get our last payment in October, so that makes it very challenging to either adjust higher or lower for the rest of the year. It only gives us about six weeks to really make any major adjustments. So uh, we're fortunate that we have had increases the past couple of years, um, but we could very easily have a decrease and be out um, you know, up to, usually it, it can fluctuate, you know, five, $10,000. So that, that can be a lot of money. So what the library directors have, have looked at, especially going through COVID and the uncertainties is a structure that will allow us to budget based on the pre, full previous year. So in 2022, our budget would be based on the 2020 numbers. It also changes the funding structure. Right now we get um, the total amount for the Washington, what Washington County um, levies is 1.6 million, about 1.2 million is the circulation funding. The other fees are a combination of resource money, outreach services, um, inter-county payments and automation fees that are given to libraries. So the um, 1.2 million right now is distributed by percentage. So what that means is that they take the non-library circulations each quarter and divide them up by percentage. So it can, um, a lot of variance can happen. We could increase a lot, but if uh, let's say West Bend or Hartford increase as well, then we could actually end up losing money. So the structure that we are recommending um, will be a structure that we base it off the 100% of the cost per circ. So each individual library will set their own cost per circ based on their total um, expenditures for the previous year and their total circulation. So we will know those um, well in advance and be able to plan for that. It also means that if our service goes up and West Bend's and Harpens go up, we will get paid. So it, it sets us up for having those things in place. Um, right now, that 1.2 million isn't based off of anything. So this will help us have the budget be based off something. Um, if in the future our services increase dramatically to our non-served Washington County residents, uh, we have um, a structure in place where we can also advocate for increased funding. We have not had an increase in funding in several years and with costs going up and services going up, uh, just the cost of things continue to increase. So we're not seeing that from the county. So it sets us up for the future to be able to advocate for those increases and justify why um, increases in that area. Much um, the, the major changes we are looking at removing West Bend Library as a resource library. We do have a resource library in Sheboygan when we merged five years ago with the Monarch Library System. So we are still getting the benefits of having um, a resource library that is required by library state statute. Uh, West Bend was an added resource library that we um, justified as no longer um, benefiting from as our individual library. So we're removing that $25,000 from our budget and we are allocating um, $151,000 and that's gonna be distributed to all of our libraries for digital resources, databases, um, resources that we, we use. Um, previously, it was a lot of print reference material back you know, 20 years ago before we had access to all of these wonderful online resources. Um, the change in funding, um, we are looking, our circulation reimbursement is going from 294,000 to 264,000. So it is a decrease of about $30,000, but with the added resource funding, we're, we will be getting $32,000 um, in increase. So it um, ends up being about a $2,000 um, increase from the system that we used last year. Uh, in 2021, we budgeted $305,000. In 2022, we're looking at $307,000. We do budget $313,000. That extra $5,000 um, or $6,000 is because of the inner county payments that we receive from uh, adjacent counties, Waukesha and Ozaki County specifically. So that's where that difference comes from. So um, I am looking for, uh, we would need a motion for that and also I need to have the contract signed by the village president and the village clerk as well as our library board president. I'll make a motion to approve the Washington County Library Services Board Agreement. I'll second. To made and seconded discussion. Questions on what was presented. Trustee Myers. Did you get the, you talked before that the next increase was in October 
Did you get that already for this month? We did just get that, yes. And how did that turn out to be? I, we were about $8,000 over budget. Thank you. Further discussion? Further discussion? Do we'll roll call on this as well. Trustee Kaminsky? Trustee Pieper? Aye. Trustee Jan Miller? Aye. Trustee Myers? Aye. Trustee Nightwriter? Aye. Trustee Baum? Trustee Hudson? Aye. Trustee Rick Miller? Aye. President Walter? Aye. Okay. Thank you. Next item under new business is item E, acquisition of property in the area of the intersection of Donges Bay and Wasaki Roads for a new Department of Public Works facility. The village board may enter into closed session per Wisconsin statutes 19.85, subsection one, subparagraph E, for the purpose of deliberating or negotiating the purchasing of public properties, the investing of public funds, or conducting other specified public business whenever competitive or bargaining reasons require a closed session and then may reconvene into open session to take such action as it deems appropriate. Should it go into closed session? Motion made and seconded. Who needs to be here? Deanna doesn't need to stay. Any further discussion on that motion to approve to go into closed session? We'll do roll call vote, please. Trustee Myers? Aye. Trustee Pieper? Aye. Trustee Baum? Aye. Trustee Hudson? Aye. Trustee Kaminsky? Trustee Rick Miller? Aye. Trustee Jan Miller? Aye. Trustee Nightrider? Aye. President Walter? Aye. All right, before we then go into closed session, the next regular village board meeting will be on Monday, November 1st at 7 p.m. here at the Village Hall boardroom and also can be accessed via WebEx. Thank you all for coming tonight. Thank you all for watching and have a good night.